and that to me is is a conquering at the highest level is to be the man who can be run through it in the blink of an eye So who is your teacher? What functions for you to um, be an accompanying partner or a guiding light or for you to keep uh, evolving? The, the, the funny thing is that in, a, in, a, in the universal sense and, and the way that I teach is that there is always the, the absolute and the relative, right? And so we the, 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 and like I said, these, these, these things have multiple implications of truth simultaneously. And so sometimes I would have to say in a relative sense, this is true. But in an absolute sense, this is true. The, the, in an absolute sense, there is no teacher, right? There is no one who can give you the things that you are looking for. The concept of the teacher is the person that is is pointing you in the right direction so that you can f find the the way to find the thing. This is the implication of the pointing to the moon scenario in Zen that Bruce Lee refers to in Enter the Dragon. Right? It's like a finger pointing to the moon. The way he presents it in that movie isn't the Zen, the full Zen uh, way of understanding that concept. That there is no one, there is n all we can do is point at the moon. I can't give you the moon, right? All I'm doing is eventually if to understand the moon, you have to yourself have to go and experience the moon. Not the moon's reflection in water right the moon itself and definitely not the moon's reflection in water when the water is being disturbed right which is in Zen what they say emotion is throwing a pebble into the water the moon's reflection is no longer the true re mm -hmm. representation of the moon so so there is no teacher I, I I am trying to facilitate the understanding uh, of a path that people can then take to realize viscerally for themselves what I'm trying to teach them. All the things that I say to them isn't the information. They are me describing what happens. I am describing to them, I'm showing them a picture of what happens. I'm pointing at the moon, right? Ultimately, they have to feel it. it, it it's very uh, easily... Uh, uh, it's very easy to see it when, when, when talking about sports, right? If, if I uh, am trying to teach somebody to throw a curveball, I can give them a textbook this fat on how to throw a curveball. I can talk to them about the theories and the arm angles and how you're supposed to hold the ball and what's supposed to happen. At the end of the day, they will not be able to throw that curveball until they stumble onto the feeling that creates the effect they're trying to create and when they find the feeling they then start to reproduce the feeling they're not necessarily and then right all the things that i said make sense in a in a much more profound way there is a description in zen about the the koan mu right uh, in zen they have these riddles that you are supposed to meditate with these riddles right and the riddles don't have any logical uh, answer and they don't have any logical answer because the Zen pardon me the Zen master is trying to get you to stop the the dialogue in your head and stop relating to the world uh, cognitively and start relating to it intuitively and viscerally directly 
because your thoughts about what you're experiencing are just as much pictures and not the real thing as me showing you a picture on my phone. You are describing the thing in language which is limited instead of just experiencing the thing. So in, in there's, there is a, a commentary on Mu, which, which means nothing. And Mu is a story about a, a guy who asks a, a, a great teacher, uh, Joshu, he asks him, does a dog have Buddha nature? And the relative answer is everything has Buddha nature. They know everything has Buddha nature. The student, they go through this where the student tests the teacher to get the teacher to respond and they have these sparring matches in terms of understanding. And Joshua replies to him, Mu, which means nothing. It's a negative, but it doesn't mean no. It means nothing, nothingness. There's no logical explanation because it's Buddhist teaching that everything has Buddha nature. Everything is from the same source. Everything is this is connected to the same thing. We are not separate from the sofa and the floor and the earth and the waves and the air particles and the atoms. We're all part of the same thing, right? But in a relative sense, what we experience is this experience of separation. We are both separate and completely unified simultaneously. Both things are true at the same time. So in the commentary on this, he says, Mu is like swallowing a red hot iron ball and having it get stuck in your throat and not being able to regurgitate it or to swallow it. It's a red hot ball that's stuck in the pit of your throat. And I, it sounds cool, like, whoa, geez, that's intense, right? But I read that for years and years and years and years in a specific book on Zen. And one day when I was meditating, I was trying to hold on to my practice. I was trying so hard to hold on to it that it's, it literally started to feel like my throat was locking up. I literally felt like it was stuck here because I'm trying to hold it, I'm trying to hold it in, in terms of concentration. You're trying not to let go of this thing. And it presents itself as a physical feeling where you, it's like, it's right there, it's right there. Don't let it go, don't let it go, don't let it go, hold on to it, hold on to it. I had not experienced that before, you know? I'm reading it and I, I think I get it. I get it. it I, he's trying to talk about the importance of Mu, that it, that it is that important that you're going to die. You, you're going to die one, whether you get it or you don't get it, you're going to die and you got to figure it out. There's another story about a guy who's hanging on a branch and there's a tiger on top and he can't climb up because the tiger's waiting to eat him and he's going to fall to the jagged rocks and die. And so what do you do? You know, what do you do? What do you say at that moment? And that's one of those riddles where it's like you're in this position where there's no escape. So now what, you know? And the end of that story is that he takes the flower and he smells it and he says, wow, what a beautiful flower, right? But <laughs> because at that moment, you know, he, the, the beauty of that moment was presented to him, it was there, right? Instead of him languishing over what the implications were, he found the beauty in that moment. But uh, so, you know, those are things that are, and, and everything is a matter of experiencing it because cognitive understanding is limited and that to truly understand something you'll notice that the people that are proficient that are teaching have to figure out how to explain what's going on and you have to figure it out in different ways for different people but that shouldn't have to happen if the information was there the way your teacher described it you know, you're trying to describe now your experience coupled with how your teacher prepared you to have that experience. And that's how you end up disseminating it to the next generation. But it's not information, it's, it's experience. I can't, the information I can tell, that's why I don't speak in, in an isolation class, I don't speak. I just do the, because nothing I tell you is going to make you move any better. Nothing you think you understand from me telling you how to move is going to make you move any better. You have the same chance of watching me for years and trying it and trying it and trying it without me verbalizing anything, of coming to that experience as if I 
I'm explaining it to you and you're trying it, trying it, and I'm explaining it to you. So my teachers have been my first karate instructor, Kenneth Graves, my second karate instructor, Master Derek Williams. Those have been my teachers. They have been my life teachers. They have been my uh, spiritual teachers. They have, they put me in a position to understand everything that I do from the context of, of living, you know, of living it. Now, as far as my growth and dance, there is no one necessary to continue to point me to the moon um, because I have those those teachers and although they are not my dance teachers I utilize everything that they taught me to continue my discovery of what I'm doing nobody has approached dance that I have been able to find to a de- uh, to the degree of spirituality that I am discussing long enough or deep enough for them to be of value to me at this point in my development and so I have to always turn to the more established uh, art forms in that direction as an indication of where I'm going you you are ultimately the teacher is always necessary the teacher is always there but the teacher becomes you after a certain time and you start to realize that uh, you are an adult in the art form when you can start and continue to grow without teacher and that is in a spiritual sense you know if you are a dancer who's learning how to dance on the internet and by throwing breakdance moves in and that's not necessarily being better than your teacher that is now you are going through different people's gates and you're you're jumbling up a lot of uh elementary ideas it's there's not a lot of depth there but to to understand how to grow spiritually now with or without the guidance of your teacher is when we classify someone as being an adult in the art form it doesn't mean that they are masters but they are ready to take that journey alone teachers there if they need them and if teachers not there they still continue to grow so yeah i i'm there is no teacher but but me and when i say me i mean the absolute me meaning life itself and what i really am at the core Okay. Yeah. And um, you also said that music and dance are purely human created expressions. And since we are already human beings, um, some might ask, are we already ready to dance yes. and have a good time? Mm-hmm. Why, why there's a need for us to practice right. and improve and learn the techniques? Right. And um, I think on your webpage, there's a quote. Yes by you yeah and it says to find true freedom in dance you must first master the structure mm. without the structure there is no freedom yes only randomness right so could you speak to this yes. a little bit so what what we normally um, you know what we see as freedom is usually to be able to do what we want to do right when, when somebody says you have financial freedom it means if I want to go to Maui tonight I can go to Maui because I have financial freedom Mm -hmm. right this is people's concept of freedom my concept of freedom is very different Uh, and I think that before we ask how can we be put into a position to do whatever we want to do and this is a a larger uh, context for the smaller question of doing whatever you want when it comes to dance and thinking that that's freedom before asking ourselves how can we be put into a position to do whatever we want to do or how do we maintain a position 
that we can do whatever we want to do. We should be asking ourselves why it is that we want to do those things in the first place. Where is the desire to do the things we think are signs of freedom there in the first place? Whether they are motivated psychologically by experiences and wiring and genetics and all those things, they are desires, right? I would say that freedom is not having to do what you want to do, is not having to do it. In other words, if I want ice cream and I want the freedom to have ice cream and I go and have ice cream, I feel free. But the problem is that you are a slave at that moment to the desire to have ice cream. And a lot of times we just want to alleviate the discomfort that a desire presents to us, right? And for most of us to alleviate that means to satisfy it. But when you think about it, those things are never satisfied. They are only quenched for a second and then they reoccur again. And so you're in this constant state of chasing. It's like uh, taking cough suppressant. You know, you're not ever curing the cold. You keep removing the cough, you know. <laughs> <laughs> We have a tendency to deal with symptoms. We are, that's how we are. That's how society is right now. We deal with symptoms. Happiness for us means we have to have all the things we want. We never address the wanting in the first place. And that the wanting is enslaving you. That the greatest slaver to us is the wanting, is the desire in the first place. The book Siddhartha that was written in the, in the 1920s, right? That book uh, is a strange book, but it talks about a, a man who kind of goes on the journey that the Buddha goes on, but he goes on it simultaneously at the time that the Buddha is around doing his thing. That book is really interesting because he joins the ascetics the same way that the that Siddhartha did. He joins these aesthetics that are that are mortifying themselves by not eating and, and, and hanging upside down and doing these things to, to get over the needs of the flesh, to, to get past the trying to satisfy the flesh all the time. And so they, they get good at suffering. They get comfortable with suffering. So when he, uh, um, he uh, finally comes back to society and when he comes back to society he realizes I want to learn from this uh, woman who's kind of like a prostitute and I want to learn about what this whole thing is about making money and so he gets into that world and starts to learn these things but he's completely unaffected by them and so everybody else is stressed out because he's losing money and to him it's like I lived for three years in a diaper eating hardly nothing you know He's laughing at these people that are stressing out that they're not making money or not. He was in a position where he was at ease because he had dealt with himself in in a way to deal uh, to 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 uh, free himself from those desires, right? And and that's where I think we mess things up. You know, we see people like Michael Jackson as role models. We see people like like. Um, you know, Jay-Z, we see people that make a lot of money as role models and and that's fine and dandy. But a lot of those people that are rich and famous are also suicidal and drug addicts and, and they, they are not necessarily fulfilled because they accomplish these things. People that want to have the perfect bodies, they still have insecurities and they still have problems with relationships and they still have attachments to other things they just look nice according to our standards right now if they go to to new guinea they're probably grotesque and nobody looks at them right it's like this whole perspective of what is cute now and what is you know anyway the point being that to to 
understand desire as a structure, right? To understand it as being a formality of some sorts that confines us, we have to study the enslaving factor. We have to study it so we can transcend it. And when we transcend it, we find the openness on the other side of it. And so the desire, right, presents itself in this context as the structure of the dance or the structure of playing a drum, right, where you have a way that you are phrasing, you have a way that you use your hand, you have a way that you produce certain sounds. And so before you learn that, you're just banging on the drum. You do, you're do, you doing whatever. I'm doing what I feel like doing and I'm, uh, this is what I feel like doing. But it makes no sense. It makes no sense. Even if it makes sense to you, it makes no sense to anybody else. It's not something that speaks to our, to the universal sense, right? But once you start to learn the, the, the parameters of how to play the drum, you are now going through this feeling of being enslaved by it. You know, you, you feel like I have to learn these structures. They're very hard to learn in order to get to a point where I can play music. I have to master these things. They're so difficult. My body's keeping me from doing what I need to do. And you have this view that your freedom existed before because you weren't worried about the structure. You just hit the drum any way you want. The problem is you're still confined. You're still a slave. But you're a slave to the fact that you have no dexterity in your body and you have no concept of musicality and you have no concept of how to produce sounds on this drum. You have to master that until it goes away. And that's what I mean by mastering it, that, that you transcend it, that there is no technique. There is no technique. Everything that I say is bullshit, right? Everything that the teacher tells you is bullshit. It is all meant to facilitate you breaking through to freedom. But the problem is that if you don't ever transcend something, you, you are always bound by it. You're always going to be bound by that thing. And that is not freedom. That is you acquiescing to slavery in a different form. And so when you are able to now produce unconsciously articulate music with your body. In other words, you are creating sentences now that are not coming from the frontal lobe. They are now coming from the subconscious. They're not cognitive things that are happening to you. They are, it is intuitively coming through you. And the rules become distant memories. In other words, you are now creating actively in the moment. You are now breaking all those structures and, and all the rules that the teacher told you at will in a way that is now uh, universal, in a way that now someone from the outside with no knowledge can observe you do this and you are manifesting something familiar now into this realm for them as opposed to just making noise. And for a lot of us, uh, making noise or not making noise is also relative, right? Because music, our, our comfort with music has to do with how we're brought up to understand music. And music that takes on different structures is familiar to the cultures that grow up with it because that's how their brain now learns that normal music is supposed to sound and so then our music will sound strange to them or abnormal the way that 6-8 music sounds funny to us and is not as normal as some uh, folkloric music sounds a little strange to us uh, or we wouldn't know how to follow it because we didn't grow up our brains didn't learn that that's how normal music operates but the 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 concept of of um of freedom is a, is about confronting yourself and about confronting where these things originate. What is really confining you from f being free? And the person, I use this a lot, but the, 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 a samurai meets a Zen master on the road and the Zen master doesn't get out of the samurai's way, which was, you know, in, in those class system in that time, the, you're supposed to move out of the way of the samurai is supposed to allow him to pass. So the samurai turns around, grabs his sword and says, don't you know that I'm a man that can run through you in the blink of an eye? 
And the Zen master looks at him and says, don't you know that I am a man that can be run through in the blink of an eye? The Zen master was, was free. The, the samurai was a slave. And so the samurai bowed to him and asked to become his student. That's the difference, you know, it's, it's not that you, the whiny child, we all have this whiny child inside of us and we tend to be attracted to things that jive with that whiny child and are adverse to things that don't jive with that whiny child. But very seldom do we consider where those feelings are coming from. And that, and very rarely do we address the whiny child. We just kind of turn it into our banter, our agreement or our disagreement, our attracted or not attracted, you know, what we're into or not into. So many people have told me, I, you know, I, I love the way you dance, it's just not me, it's not for me. And I, I've, I find that to be a very uh, small, perspective of of what we are what you are and what the potential of studying something seriously is for you and that those things uh, we see everything as manifesting itself in these different forms but ultimately at the end of the day we're talking about a universal thing in Zen there there is a great question about if we are all innately enlightened, if we are all innately perfect as we are, then why do we have to practice, right? And which is essentially the question that you're asking me. This is what drove the founder of the Soto Zen sect, uh, Dogen. This is what drove him. This was the thing that was eating at him. And he kept jumping from temple to temple because none of the teachers could answer that question for him. If we're perfect already, why do we have to practice? Why do we have to practice? Why do we have to practice? And nobody gave him a satisfactory answer. The problem isn't that we are, we are perfect. We are all perfect exactly the way. That whole thing about humans not being perfect is, is a limited view of perfection. A flat tire is perfect. <laughs> our idea of perfect is everything goes right in our fantasy world. And to be perfect is to try to maintain everything to be an idea that we have in our heads about what things are supposed to be. Except that life isn't like that, right? Planets explode, stars explode, tidal waves. The earth is, has changed its climate over and over and over and over again. We are not hurting the earth. We are hurting our chances to continue to live on the earth, but the earth is fine. The earth is going to be fine it's gone through these things multiple times. Our problem is that our idea of perfection and then our acquiescence to the fact that we don't fit into that. We're human, so we err. The, the, the fact is that we err, so we're human, right? That, that we are perfectly exactly what human beings are supposed to be. There is nothing we need. There is nothing left out. Understanding that is like understanding a curveball, right? You can understand it theoretically and, and mathematically make it make sense. In other words, that a flat tire is a perfect flat tire because it is exactly what a flat tire is supposed to be. It is because we need it to be something else in our minds. The fantasy of a tire that isn't flat is now superimposed on the flat tire and now the flat tire doesn't get credit for its glory as a flat tire. It is compared to what we need or think a tire is supposed to be. And that's the cognitive thing that detaches us from reality. We can't see the perfection in each other, we can't see the perfection in ourselves because we are expecting of someone. We are superimposing our needs of the people around us, how they work into providing us with the stuff that we need. And when they don't provide us with those things, then we classify them as being negative or bad people to have around. Or, or uh, But it's, it's a super selfish 
thing that we're doing. We, we're not recognizing the fact that we're looking at the mirror when we see somebody else. That, that quantum physics has already scientifically proven that we are not separated like we think we are manifesting separate. That there are possible multiple universes where the, there's different yous and that all possibilities are existing simultaneously and that atomically you can't tell the difference between your leg and the sofa and the air and the water particles and the, the there's no separation between that our perspective manifests itself like waves in the ocean as at a, in the macro sense as separate manifestations but there are other perspectives there are other ways to see reality we don't see ultraviolet we don't see infrared we don't see the universe the way it is you know but we take these hard and fast lines because they logically make sense to us the human animal which is limited and because of that we are exactly what we're supposed to be we are supposed to be human we are supposed to view the world humanly the way a dog sees certain colors and doesn't see the colors we see they have two receptors in their eye and we have three so there's a whole spectrum of colors we see that they don't see if the dog thinks that the world he's seeing is the way the world is, then he's wrong. But we don't see all the spectrums of light. So we're just as incorrect in assuming that what we observe through our senses is reality in its complete sense. And so that hinders us, you know? It, it makes sense on this hand, but doesn't make sense on this hand. And when something doesn't make sense to us, it, wait a minute, like Einstein rejected quantum physics because Einstein was religious and quantum physics wasn't as pretty as physics. It, it, things were happening that were very, very awkward and they didn't jive with the perfect, beautiful way, mathematical way he had found that he thought was a divine uh, infusion that bothered him, you know? Um, and now they're trying to figure out how they both, the unifying theory and how they both exist together. These things are, are profound, but in a small sense, you're limited to what your body can produce physically and musically. And so you are a slave to those limitations. If I can address that, and instead of addressing the desire for me to jump around, which is why people normally dance, because they have a desire to jump around, it makes them feel good, it produces certain chemicals. So you want to jump around, especially if it's connected to music that is also producing chemicals. Now the jumping around chemicals and the music chemicals are creating a high, and you're basically a drug addict, and that's all great. But if you are going to really find the joy that dance implies the potential the same way that if you're going to find the joy in life the potential of this life and what it implies you can't deal with one extreme or the other and that the that joy is different from elation right that being high or being hopped up on adrenaline isn't being happy being happy is being centered and being calm and being reserved in in peace that you're okay with everything being as it is that's being that's joy you know i'm happy usually means you're hopped up with chemicals you know to be in a serene state when you go to a mountain range and you look out over the ocean or you you know, you, 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 you hear the jungle and that feeling is joy. Things are as they are and I'm okay with it. And even if things are bad, what I view as bad, that's how they are and I'm okay with it and that's how this, it's supposed to be. I feel pain and I feel pleasure, but I don't attach to them. They, the pain is not going to be there forever. The pleasure is not going to be there for you. You're experiencing things as they are, you know, 
and, and that is the difference you know the, the difference is are you looking for the drug hit or are you looking for the joy that is implied by that drug hit you know the fact that you you are getting this adrenaline and this connection to music and to dance and to moving your body but it's implying something much deeper than the chemicals that it's producing there in that instance and if that is what you want then you go jump around and, and some people run 20 miles and they get high off of that some people go to a nightclub and drink Red Bull and they bounce around and get all sweaty other people smoke cigarettes other people take drugs other people compose music you know we're all looking for a high somehow this makes me feel good this makes me feel good this makes me feel good but what happens is that eventually it takes more and more of that stuff to get the same high and when that starts to dull then what happens and it usually starts to dull just as you're entering the second phase of understanding the thing that you're doing and then because you're starting to dull the chemicals are starting to dull you get bored and then you start looking for another thing and it now no longer holds the place in your life that it held and you now didn't even have a chance to get into the joy part of it because you are searching for different opiate you're, you're searching for a high from this and a high from that and a high. And once it doesn't make you feel that way you you're I'm bored and I don't know and I don't want to go and I don't it changes how you do it but and it's unfortunate because we rely on those chemicals to keep us doing something and that's not reality that's you being high you know the reality is when you're not high <laughs> you know that's when reality sets in when the fever goes away that's when you're confronted with the real thing and now what now how do you uh, approach it now what is there to understand now what does it have there of value to be gotten and you will find that it's something very different than the adrenaline boost you know so so you said we are going to master the technical aspects just so that we can transcend that aspect and become free so it seems like we have two different mountains in front of us so we first have to climb the first one mastering the stuff that you need to do and then become being able to um, be free unenslaving ourselves from what you had learned before is that an okay description of the idea? I would say that it is the same it's the same mountain it is that we um, our view of what the mountain is is dependent on how far up the mountain we are and so we we view the um, the 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 transcendence of the system or, or the, the the mastery of technique to get beyond technique as as two completely different things but but they are they are the same thing it's just that we were trying to facilitate the understanding of the absolute thing through the relative mm -hmm. and the I had a, a teacher in the Navy who was teaching one of the classes, uh, electronics classes, and he said to us once, when he went through school, he understood all the stuff he did good in school because it's a lot of formulas and you know circuits and how to follow circuits and a lot of math, right? And so he said, you know, you, you go through school and you learn the formulas and you figure it out. Then you go to work and it's like something completely different. And now you're actually working on circuits and following schematics and stuff like that but then when he returned to teach it his schooling and his work experience now culminated as he was going back through the material again to reintroduce it to somebody else it completely made sense to him now it come all the things all the components now really gelled for him and I found that super interesting because it, it is it is how we experience a lot of things. We learn them technically, but then when we have to go out and actually use them, it's a different thing. And then when you turn around and you are the one teaching it to another generation, your the the 
the journey of finding out how to facilitate understanding in someone else produces a search in a different way of the of the material and how you are using the material and, and how the material relates to reality and I think that that is the that is you know the in, in a simple way the, the the gelling of all those things you know N not the assuming that you understand this is what the difference is after school you assume you understand it because you you're learning it technically and mathematically and then when you get into the real world you realize this is a little more complicated than just the math and the way they showed it to me in school you have to now you got to mm -hmm. you can go to medical school but you still got to learn how to put a needle in somebody's arm and that you have to <laughs> You know what I'm saying? You you can't do that in a textbook. You have to that has to you have to figure that out. And some people are very bad at it. Uh, the point is that you 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 know that that it's the 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 transcending of the of the concepts because the concepts are always going to be limited. It just means that you become fluid and that you don't become bound by those things. It is it is the idea of non-attachment in Buddhism non-attachment right even to the concept of non-attachment <laughs> right this is true non-attachment if you have non-attachment but you always say ah oh, you're attached ah oh, you're attached and you are a slave to non-attachment it's like for example i had a friend once told tell me that they were visiting a very uh a renowned spiritual teacher in India and there was a long line to visit this teacher and while they were on the line an insect got close to them and she swiped at the insect and somebody else on the line lost their mind no you can't don't hurt the and you can't and the life and the thing and don't hurt life and that person was attached to the concept of respecting all life that's still attachment you know and, and this is why you are to find freedom you have to be sure that you're, what you're finding is freedom and not that you're becoming attached to a different principle that you're not becoming confined by a new principle uh, I like to watch the show The Dog Whisperer right the dog whisperer Caesar Milan he's like amazing with dogs he trains dogs he's, he's like he, he can like communicate with his nuts right so there's a woman that watched all his shows and she learned from watching all the shows, read all his books and she started to work as a dog, uh, rehabilitating dogs. And she had rehabilitated like 20 different dogs and she was doing really well and she comes up with this case and this dog, she's trying to get the dog adopted and she cannot, the dog is fine when it's with her but when he's in the cage and people come to see him, He's a little aggressive and he'll bite at them and, and now nobody wants to adopt him because he's a little weird and she's working with him, working with she can't figure him out. So there's an episode where she, who learned from this guy, all his principles, all his stuff, she learned secondhand because he wasn't there with her, but she has to call him in now to help her with a case that she can't figure out. And so he asked her, did you try this? And she said, yeah, I tried that. And he said, okay. And he's looking, watching the dog and he says, did you try this? And she's like, yeah, I tried that too, honey. He's like, okay, I'm gonna take the dog with me for a week. He takes the dog and goes to a guy he knows that trains dogs to find bombs. And he asked the guy to test the dog. And the dog tests through the roof. The dog was the most talented bomb sniffing. It showed all the signs that you look for, but they were like, he was a bomb sniffing genius, this dog. And so the guy kept him, and he's and the dog has been the happiest and most well-adjusted dog ever since. The point of this story is that when I saw that episode, I the, immediately I wanted to see what was the difference between the girl and between Caesar, and that the master comes in, and what did he do differently than what the girl did? And the girl's doing everything the master taught. But what happened was the girl was confined to everything the master taught and the master was fluid right and that he was flexible now 
to think outside of the parameters of the things that he was teaching in order to find the solution to the problem at the moment. She was still not at the level to have achieved that fluidity. She was still learning and mastering and acquiring the concepts. She had not yet transcended them where they didn't hold sway over her. She could easily manipulate them to find what she needed to find in that moment. And that's what we're talking about in terms of mastery is to find fluidity, is to find adaptability, is to find acceptance that the situation is always going to be its own unique situation. It's never going to be exactly what you prepare for, exactly what you think it's supposed to be. You know, the, the, these, uh, you know, the universe is alive and things, like I said, factors are playing into things that you, it's hard to prepare for. But if you prepare for being prepared, then you have a different flexibility in terms of dealing with these things and accepting them and not not just dealing with them and conquering them but accepting them as they are and that to me is is a conquering at the highest level is to be the man who can be run through it in the blink of an eye and be okay with that you know that is deep because we're so worried about self-preservation and we're so afraid of death and we're so um quick to assign value to things and really honestly if the planet exploded tomorrow the universe doesn't even blink you know I think it was a, a character in, in the comic book Watchmen that said that and he said if the earth explodes tomorrow the universe it doesn't care like n nothing is really affected at all we're so small and for some people that is daunting but it's because they're still dealing with it from their insecurities you know and they're not seeing it from the the liberation that that provides that means that the problems you think are so big are really super tiny it's just that you are super tiny and so little things seem very big to you your perspective is very big but from Uranus, the Earth blows up and, you know, Uranus is, who cares, you know, like the processes keep going, you know, it, it doesn't, it doesn't change a thing, a thing. And, and, and that is being okay with that, not understanding it, not understanding it here, but being okay with that in your gut, you know, that, that you're operating from that okayness. Everything is okay. That's a big Zen saying everything's okay. Mm.